Chapter 13. The Delights of Anticipation. IT's time Anne was in to do her sewing, said Marilla, glancing at the clock and then out into the yellow August afternoon where everything drowsed in the heat. She stayed playing with Diana more than half an hour more and I gave her leave to, and now she's perched out there on the wood pile talking to Matthew, 19 to the dozen, when she knows perfectly well she ought to be at her work. And of course he's listening to her like a perfect ninny. I never saw such an infatuated man. The more she talks and the odder the things she says, the more he's delighted evidently. And surely, you come right in here this minute, do you hear me? A series of staccato taps on the west window brought in flying in from the yard, eyes shining, cheeks faintly flushed with pink, unbraided hair streaming behind her in a torrent of brightness. Oh Arilla, she exclaimed breathlessly, there's going to be a Sunday school picnic next week, in Mr. Harmon Andrews's field, right near the Lake of Shining Waters. And Mrs. Superintendent Bell and Mrs. Rachel Lind are going to make ice cream, think of it, Marilla, ice cream. And, oh, Marilla, can I go to it? Just look at the clock, if you please, Anne. What time did I tell you to come in? Two o'clock, but isn't it splendid about the picnic, Marilla? Please can I go? Oh, I've never been to a picnic, I've dreamed of picnics, but I've never. Yes, I told you to come at two o'clock. And it's a quarter to three. I'd like to know why you didn't obey me, Anne. Why, I meant to, Marilla, as much as could be. But you have no idea how fascinating Idlewild is. And then, of course, I had to tell Matthew about the picnic. Matthew is such a sympathetic listener. Please can I go? You'll have to learn to resist the fascination of idle whatever you call it. When I tell you to come in at a certain time I mean that time and not half an hour later. And you needn't stop to discourse with sympathetic listeners on your way, either. As for the picnic, of course you can go. You're a Sunday school scholar, and it's not likely I'd refuse to let you go when all the other little girls are going. But, but, faltered Anne, Diana says that everybody must take a basket of things to eat. I can't cook, as you know, Orilla, and, and, I don't mind going to a picnic without puffed sleeves so much, but I'd feel terribly humiliated if I had to go without a basket. It's been preying on my mind ever since Diana told me. Well, it needn't pray any longer. I'll bake you a basket. Oh, you dear good Marilla. Oh, you are so kind to me. Oh, I'm so much obliged to you. Getting through with her o's and cast herself into Marilla's arms and rapturously kissed her sallow cheek. It was the first time in her whole life that childish lips had voluntarily touched Marilla's face. Again that sudden sensation of startling sweetness thrilled her. She was secretly vastly pleased at Anne's impulsive caress, which was probably the reason why she said brusquely. There, there, never mind your kissing nonsense. I'd sooner see you doing strictly as you're told. As for cooking, I mean to begin giving you lessons in that some of these days. But you're so feather-brained, and I've been waiting to see if you'd sober down a little and learn to be steady before I begin. You've got to keep your wits about you in cooking and not stop in the middle of things to let your thoughts rove all over creation. Now, get out your patchwork and have your square done before tea time. I do not like patchwork, said and dolefully, hunting out her work basket and sitting down before a little heap of red and white diamonds with a sigh. I think some kinds of sewing would be nice, but there's no scope for imagination in patchwork. It's just one little seam after another and you never seem to be getting anywhere. But of course I'd rather be in of Green Gables sewing patchwork than in of any other place with nothing to do but play. I wish time went as quick sewing patches as it does when I'm playing with Diana, though. Oh, we do have such elegant times, Marilla. I have to furnish most of the imagination, but I'm well able to do that. Diana is simply perfect in every other way. You know that little piece of land across the brook that runs up between our farm and Mr. Barry's. It belongs to Mr. William Bell, and right in the corner there is a little ring of white birch trees, the most romantic spot, Marilla. Diana and I have our playhouse there. We call it Idlewild. Isn't that a poetical name? I assure you it took me some time to think it out. I stayed awake nearly a whole night before I invented it. Then, just as I was dropping off to sleep, it came like an inspiration. Diana was enraptured when she heard it. We have got our house fixed up elegantly. You must come and see it, Marilla, won't you? We have great big stones, all covered with moss, for seats, and boards from tree to tree for shelves. And we have all our dishes on them. Of course, they're all broken but it's the easiest thing in the world to imagine that they are whole. There's a piece of a plate with a spray of red and yellow ivy on it that is especially beautiful. We keep it in the parlor and we have the fairy glass there, too. The fairy glass is as lovely as a dream. Diana found it out in the woods behind their chicken house. It's all full of rainbows, just little young rainbows that haven't grown big yet, 
and Diana's mother told her it was broken off a hanging lamp they once had. But it's nice to imagine the fairies lost it one night when they had a ball, so we call it the fairy glass. Matthew is going to make us a table. Oh, we have named that little round pool over in Mr. Barry's field Willamere. I got that name out of the book Diana lent me. That was a thrilling book, Marilla. The heroine had five lovers. I'd be satisfied with one, wouldn't you? She was very handsome and she went through great tribulations. She could faint as easy as anything. I'd love to be able to faint, wouldn't you, Marilla? It's so romantic. But I'm really very healthy for all I'm so thin. I believe I'm getting fatter, though. Don't you think I am? I look at my elbows every morning when I get up to see if any dimples are coming. Diana is having a new dress made with elbow sleeves. She is going to wear it to the picnic. Oh, I do hope it will be fine next Wednesday. I don't feel that I could endure the disappointment if anything happened to prevent me from getting to the picnic. I suppose I'd live through it, but I'm certain it would be a lifelong sorrow. It wouldn't matter if I got to a hundred picnics in after years, they wouldn't make up for missing this one. They're going to have boats on the Lake of Shining Waters, and ice cream, as I told you. I have never tasted ice cream. Diana tried to explain what it was like, but I guess ice cream is one of those things that are beyond imagination. And, you have talked even on for ten minutes by the clock, said Marilla. Now, just for curiosity's sake, see if you can hold your tongue for the same length of time. And held her tongue as desired. But for the rest of the week she talked picnic and thought picnic and dreamed picnic. On Saturday it rained and she worked herself up into such a frantic state lest it should keep on raining until and over Wednesday that Marilla made her sue an extra patchwork square by way of steadying her nerves. On Sunday Anne confided to Marilla on the way home from church that she grew actually cold all over with excitement when the minister announced the picnic from the pulpit. Such a thrill as went up and down my back, Marilla. I don't think I'd ever really believed until then that there was honestly going to be a picnic. I couldn't help fearing I'd only imagined it. But when a minister says a thing in the pulpit you just have to believe it. You set your heart too much on things, Anne, said Marilla, with a sigh. I'm afraid there'll be a great many disappointments in store for you through life. Oh Marilla, looking forward to things is half the pleasure of them, exclaimed Anne. You mayn't get the things themselves, but nothing can prevent you from having the fun of looking forward to them. Mrs. Lynde says, Blessed are they who expect nothing for they shall not be disappointed. But I think it would be worse to expect nothing than to be disappointed. Marilla wore her amethyst brooch to church that day as usual. Marilla always wore her amethyst brooch to church. She would have thought it rather sacrilegious to leave it off, as bad as forgetting her Bible or her collection dime. That amethyst brooch was Marilla's most treasured possession. A seafaring uncle had given it to her mother who in turn had bequeathed it to Marilla. It was an old-fashioned oval, containing a braid of her mother's hair, surrounded by a border of very fine amethysts. Marilla knew too little about precious stones to realize how fine the amethysts actually were, but she thought them very beautiful and was always pleasantly conscious of their violet shimmer at her throat, above her good brown satin dress, even although she could not see it. And had been smitten with delighted admiration when she first saw that brooch. Oh Marilla, it's a perfectly elegant brooch. I don't know how you can pay attention to the sermon or the prayers when you have it on. I couldn't, I know. I think amethysts are just sweet. They are what I used to think diamonds were like. Long ago, before I had ever seen a diamond, I read about them and I tried to imagine what they would be like. I thought they would be lovely glimmering purple stones. When I saw a real diamond in a lady's ring one day I was so disappointed I cried. Of course, it was very lovely but it wasn't my idea of a diamond. Will you let me hold the brooch for one minute, Marilla? Do you think amethysts can be the souls of good violets? Dash. Chapter 14. Anne's Confession. On the Monday evening before the picnic Marilla came down from her room with a troubled face. And, she said to that small personage, who was shelling peas by the spotless table and singing, Nellie of the Hazel Dell with a vigor and expression that did credit to Diana's teaching, did you see anything of my amethyst brooch? I thought I stuck it in my pincushion when I came home from church yesterday evening, but I can't find it anywhere. I, I saw it this afternoon when you were away at the AIDS Society, said Anne, a little slowly. I was passing your door when I saw it on the cushion, so I went in to look at it. Did you touch it? said Marilla sternly. Why yes, admitted Anne, I took it up and I pinned it on my breast just to see how it would look. You had no business to do anything of the sort. It's very wrong in a little girl to meddle. You shouldn't have gone into my room in the first place and you shouldn't have touched a brooch that didn't belong to you in the second. Where did you put it? Oh, I put it back on the bureau. I hadn't it on a minute. Truly, I didn't mean to meddle, Marilla. 
I didn't think about its being wrong to go in and try on the brooch, but I see now that it was and I'll never do it again. That's one good thing about me. I never do the same naughty thing twice. You didn't put it back, said Marilla. That brooch isn't anywhere on the bureau. You've taken it out or something, Anne. I did put it back, said Anne quickly, pertly, Marilla thought. I don't just remember whether I stuck it on the pincushion or laid it in the china tray. But I'm perfectly certain I put it back. I'll go and have another look, said Marilla, determining to be just. If you put that brooch back it's there still. If it isn't I'll know you didn't, that's all. Marilla went to her room and made a thorough search, not only over the bureau but in every other place she thought the brooch might possibly be. It was not to be found and she returned to the kitchen. And the brooch is gone. By your own admission you were the last person to handle it. Now, what have you done with it? Tell me the truth at once. Did you take it out and lose it? No, I didn't, said Anne solemnly, meeting Marilla's angry gaze squarely. I never took the brooch out of your room and that is the truth, if I was to be led to the block for it, although I'm not very certain what a block is. So there, Marilla. And so there was only intended to emphasize her assertion, but Marilla took it as a display of defiance. I believe you are telling me a falsehood, and, she said sharply. I know you are. There now, don't say anything more unless you are prepared to tell the whole truth. Go to your room and stay there until you are ready to confess. Will I take the peas with me? Said in meekly. No, I'll finish shelling them myself. Do as I bid you. When Anne had gone Marilla went about her evening tasks in a very disturbed state of mind. She was worried about her valuable brooch. What if Anne had lost it? And how wicked of the child to deny having taken it, when anybody could see she must have. With such an innocent face, too. I don't know what I wouldn't sooner have had happen, thought Marilla, as she nervously shelled the peas. Of course, I don't suppose she meant to steal it or anything like that. She's just taken it to play with or help along that imagination of hers. She must have taken it, that's clear, for there hasn't been a soul in that room since she was in it, by her own story, until I went up tonight. And the brooch is gone, there's nothing sure. I suppose she has lost it and is afraid to own up for fear she'll be punished. It's a dreadful thing to think she tells falsehoods. It's a far worse thing than her fit of temper. It's a fearful responsibility to have a child in your house you can't trust. Slyness and untruthfulness, that's what she has displayed. I declare I feel worse about that than about the brooch. If she'd only have told the truth about it I wouldn't mind so much. Marilla went to her room at intervals all through the evening and searched for the brooch, without finding it. A bedtime visit to the East Gable produced no result. And persisted in denying that she knew anything about the brooch but Marilla was only the more firmly convinced that she did. She told Matthew the story the next morning. Matthew was confounded and puzzled, he could not so quickly lose faith in Anne but he had to admit that circumstances were against her. You're sure it hasn't fell down behind the bureau? Was the only suggestion he could offer. I've moved the bureau and I've taken out the drawers and I've looked in every crack and cranny was Marilla's positive answer. The brooch is gone and that child has taken it and lied about it. That's the plain, ugly truth, Matthew Cuthbert, and we might as well look it in the face. Well now, what are you going to do about it? Matthew asked forlornly, feeling secretly thankful that Marilla and not he had to deal with the situation. He felt no desire to put his oar in this time. She'll stay in her room until she confesses, said Marilla grimly, remembering the success of this method in the former case. Then we'll see. Perhaps we'll be able to find the brooch if she'll only tell where she took it, but in any case she'll have to be severely punished, Matthew. Well now, you'll have to punish her, said Matthew, reaching for his hat. I've nothing to do with it, remember. You warned me off yourself. Marilla felt deserted by everyone. She could not even go to Mrs. Lynde for advice. She went up to the East Gable with a very serious face and left it with a face more serious still. And steadfastly refused to confess. She persisted in asserting that she had not taken the brooch. The child had evidently been crying and Marilla felt a pang of pity which she sternly repressed. By night she was, as she expressed it, beat out. You'll stay in this room until you confess, Anne. You can make up your mind to that, she said firmly. But the picnic is tomorrow, Marilla, cried Anne. You won't keep me from going to that, will you? You'll just let me out for the afternoon, won't you? Then I'll stay here as long as you like afterwards cheerfully. But I must go to the picnic. You'll not go to picnics nor anywhere else until you've confessed, Anne. Oh, Marilla, gasped Anne. But Marilla had gone out and shut the door. Wednesday morning dawned as bright and fair as if expressly made to order for the picnic. Birds sang around green gables, 
the Madonna lilies in the garden sent out whiffs of perfume that entered in on viewless winds at every door and window, and wandered through halls and rooms like spirits of benediction. The birches in the hollow waved joyful hands as if watching for Anne's usual morning greeting from the east gable. But Anne was not at her window. When Marilla took her breakfast up to her she found the child sitting primly on her bed, pale and resolute, with tight shut lips and gleaming eyes. Marilla, I'm ready to confess. Ah. Marilla laid down her tray. Once again her method had succeeded, but her success was very bitter to her. Let me hear what you have to say then, Anne. I took the amethyst brooch, said Anne, as if repeating a lesson she had learned. I took it just as you said. I didn't mean to take it when I went in. But it did look so beautiful, Marilla, when I pinned it on my breast that I was overcome by an irresistible temptation. I imagined how perfectly thrilling it would be to take it to Idlewild and play I was the Lady Cordelia Fitzgerald. It would be so much easier to imagine I was the Lady Cordelia if I had a real amethyst brooch on. Diana and I make necklaces of roseberries but what are roseberries compared to amethysts? So I took the brooch. I thought I could put it back before you came home. I went all the way around by the road to lengthen out the time. When I was going over the bridge across the lake of shining waters I took the brooch off to have another look at it. Oh, how it did shine in the sunlight. And then, when I was leaning over the bridge, it just slipped through my fingers, so, and went down, 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 all purply sparkling, and sank forevermore beneath the lake of shining waters. And that's the best I can do at confessing, Marilla. Marilla felt hot anger surge up into her heart again. This child had taken and lost her treasured amethyst brooch and now sat there calmly reciting the details thereof without the least apparent compunction or repentance. And this is terrible, she said, trying to speak calmly. You are the very wickedest girl I ever heard of. Yes, I suppose I am, agreed and tranquilly. And I know I'll have to be punished. It'll be your duty to punish me, Marilla. Won't you please get it over right off because I'd like to go to the picnic with nothing on my mind. Picnic, indeed. You'll go to no picnic today, and surely. That shall be your punishment. And it isn't half severe enough either for what you've done. Not go to the picnic. And sprang to her feet and clutched Marilla's hand. But you promised me I might. Oh, Marilla, I must go to the picnic. That was why I confessed. Punish me any way you like but that. Oh, Marilla, please, please, let me go to the picnic. Think of the ice cream. For anything you know I may never have a chance to taste ice cream again. Marilla disengaged Anne's clinging hand stonily. You needn't plead, Anne. You are not going to the picnic and that's final. No, not a word. And realized that Marilla was not to be moved. She clasped her hands together, gave a piercing shriek, and then flung herself face downward on the bed, crying and writhing in an utter abandonment of disappointment and despair. For the land's sake, gasped Marilla, hastening from the room. I believe the child is crazy. No child in her senses would behave as she does. If she isn't she's utterly bad. Oh dear, I'm afraid Rachel was right from the first. But I've put my hand to the plow and I won't look back. That was a dismal morning. Marilla worked fiercely and scrubbed the porch floor and the dairy shelves when she could find nothing else to do. Neither the shelves nor the porch needed it, but Marilla did. Then she went out and raked the yard. When dinner was ready she went to the stairs and called Anne. A tear-stained face appeared, looking tragically over the banisters. Come down to your dinner, Anne. I don't want any dinner, Marilla, said Anne, sobbingly. I couldn't eat anything. My heart is broken. You'll feel remorse of conscience some day, I expect, for breaking it, Marilla, but I forgive you. Remember when the time comes that I forgive you. But please don't ask me to eat anything, especially boiled pork and greens. Boiled pork and greens are so unromantic when one is in affliction. Exasperated, Marilla returned to the kitchen and poured out her tale of woe to Matthew, who, between his sense of justice and his unlawful sympathy with Anne, was a miserable man. Well now, she shouldn't have taken the brooch, Marilla, or told stories about it, he admitted, mournfully surveying his plateful of unromantic pork and greens as if he, like Anne, thought it a food unsuited to crises of feeling, but she's such a little thing, such an interesting little thing. Don't you think it's pretty rough not to let her go to the picnic when she's so set on it? Matthew Cuthbert, I'm amazed at you. I think I've let her off entirely too easy. And she doesn't appear to realize how wicked she's been at all, that's what worries me most. If she'd really felt sorry it wouldn't be so bad. And you don't seem to realize it, neither, you're making excuses for her all the time to yourself, I can see that. Well now, she's such a little thing, feebly reiterated Matthew. And there should be allowances made, Marilla. You know she's never had any bringing up. 
Well, she's having it now retorted Marilla. The retort silenced Matthew if it did not convince him. That dinner was a very dismal meal. The only cheerful thing about it was Jerry Biot, the hired boy, and Marilla resented his cheerfulness as a personal insult. When her dishes were washed and her bread sponge set and her hands fed Marilla remembered that she had noticed a small rent in her best black lace shawl when she had taken it off on Monday afternoon on returning from the ladies' aid. She would go and mend it. The shawl was in a box in her trunk. As Marilla lifted it out, the sunlight, falling through the vines that clustered thickly about the window, struck upon something caught in the shawl, something that glittered and sparkled in facets of violet light. Marilla snatched at it with a gasp. It was the amethyst brooch, hanging to a thread of the lace by its catch. Dear life and heart, said Marilla blankly, what does this mean? Here's my brooch safe and sound that I thought was at the bottom of Barry's pond. Whatever did that girl mean by saying she took it and lost it? I declare I believe Green Gables is bewitched. I remember now that when I took off my shawl Monday afternoon I laid it on the bureau for a minute. I suppose the brooch got caught in it somehow. Well. Marilla betook herself to the east gable, brooch in hand. And had cried herself out and was sitting dejectedly by the window. And surely, said Marilla solemnly, I've just found my brooch hanging to my black lace shawl. Now I want to know what that rigmarole you told me this morning meant. Why, you said you'd keep me here until I confessed, returned Anne wearily, and so I decided to confess because I was bound to get to the picnic. I thought out a confession last night after I went to bed and made it as interesting as I could. And I said it over and over so that I wouldn't forget it. But you wouldn't let me go to the picnic after all, so all my trouble was wasted. Marilla had to laugh in spite of herself. But her conscience pricked her. Anne, you do beat all. But I was wrong, I see that now. I shouldn't have doubted your word when I'd never known you to tell a story. Of course, it wasn't right for you to confess to a thing you hadn't done, it was very wrong to do so. But I drove you to it. So if you'll forgive me, Anne, I'll forgive you and we'll start square again. And now get yourself ready for the picnic. And flew up like a rocket. Oh, Arilla, isn't it too late? No, it's only two o'clock. They won't be more than well gathered yet and it'll be an hour before they have tea. Wash your face and comb your hair and put on your gingham. I'll fill a basket for you. There's plenty of stuff baked in the house. And I'll get Jerry to hitch up the sorrel and drive you down to the picnic ground. Oh, Arilla, exclaimed Anne, flying to the washstand. Five minutes ago I was so miserable I was wishing I'd never been born and now I wouldn't change places with an angel. That night a thoroughly happy, completely tired out and returned to Green Gables in a state of beatification impossible to describe. Oh Marilla, I've had a perfectly scrumptious time. Scrumptious is a new word I learned today. I heard Mary Alice Bell use it. Isn't it very expressive? Everything was lovely. We had a splendid tea and then Mr. Harmon Andrews took us all for a row on the Lake of Shining Waters, six of us at a time. And Jane Andrews nearly fell overboard. She was leaning out to pick water lilies and if Mr. Andrews hadn't caught her by her sash just in the nick of time she'd fallen in and probably been drowned. I wish it had been me. It would have been such a romantic experience to have been nearly drowned. It would be such a thrilling tale to tell. And we had the ice cream. Words fail me to describe that ice cream. Marilla, I assure you it was sublime. That evening Marilla told the whole story to Matthew over her stocking basket. I'm willing to own up that I made a mistake, she concluded candidly but I've learned a lesson. I have to laugh when I think of Anne's confession, although I suppose I shouldn't for it really was a falsehood. But it doesn't seem as bad as the other would have been, somehow, and anyhow I'm responsible for it. That child is hard to understand in some respects. But I believe she'll turn out all right yet. And there's one thing certain no house will ever be dull that she's in. Dash. Chapter 15. A Tempest in the School Teapot. What a splendid day, said Anne, drawing a long breath. Isn't it good just to be alive on a day like this? I pity the people who aren't born yet for missing it. They may have good days, of course, but they can never have this one. And it's splendider still to have such a lovely way to go to school by, isn't it? It's a lot nicer than going round by the road, that is so dusty and hot, said Diana practically, peeping into her dinner basket and mentally calculating if the three juicy, toothsome, raspberry tarts reposing there were divided among ten girls how many bites each girl would have. The little girls of Avonlea School always pooled their lunches, and to eat three raspberry tarts all alone or even to share them only with one's best chum would have forever and ever branded as awful mean the girl who did it. And yet, when the tarts were divided among ten girls you just got enough to tantalize you. The way Anne and Diana went to school was a pretty one. 
and thought those walks to and from school with Diana couldn't be improved upon even by imagination. Going around by the main road would have been so unromantic, but to go by Lover's Lane and Willowmere and Violet Vale and the Birch Path was romantic, if ever anything was. Lover's Lane opened out below the orchard at Green Gables and stretched far up into the woods to the end of the Cuthbert Farm. It was the way by which the cows were taken to the back pasture and they would halt home in winter, and had named it Lover's Lane before she had been a month at Green Gables. Not that lovers ever really walk there, she explained to Marilla, but Diana and I are reading a perfectly magnificent book and there's a lover's lane in it. So we want to have one, too. And it's a very pretty name, don't you think? So romantic. We can't imagine the lovers into it, you know. I like that lane because you can think out loud there without people calling you crazy. And, starting out alone in the morning, went down lover's lane as far as the brook. Here Diana met her, and the two little girls went on up the lane under the leafy arch of maples, maples are such sociable trees, said Anne, they're always rustling and whispering to you until they came to a rustic bridge. Then they left the lane and walked through Mr. Barry's back field and past Willamere. Beyond Willamere came Violet Vale, a little green dimple in the shadow of Mr. Andrew Bell's big woods. Of course there are no violets there now, Anne told Marilla, but Diana says there are millions of them in spring. Oh Marilla, can't you just imagine you see them? It actually takes away my breath. I named it Violet Vale. Diana says she never saw the beat of me for hitting on fancy names for places. It's nice to be clever at something, isn't it? But Diana named the Birch Path. She wanted to, so I let her, but I'm sure I could have found something more poetical than plain Birch Path. Anybody can think of a name like that. But the Birch Path is one of the prettiest places in the world, Marilla. It was. Other people besides and thought so when they stumbled on it. It was a little narrow, twisting path, winding down over a long hill straight through Mr. Bell's woods, where the light came down sifted through so many emerald screens that it was as flawless as the heart of a diamond. It was fringed in all its length with slim young birches, white-stemmed and lissom-bowed, ferns and starflowers and wild lilies of the valley and scarlet tufts of pigeon berries grew thickly along it, and always there was a delightful spiciness in the air and music of bird calls and the murmur and laugh of wood winds in the trees overhead. Now and then you might see a rabbit skipping across the road if you were quiet, which, with Anne and Diana, happened about once in a blue moon. Down in the valley the path came out to the main road and then it was just up the spruce hill to the school. The Avonlea school was a whitewashed building, low in the eaves and wide in the windows, furnished inside with comfortable substantial old-fashioned desks that opened and shut, and were carved all over their lids with the initials and hieroglyphics of three generations of school children. The schoolhouse was set back from the road and behind it was a dusky fir wood and a brook where all the children put their bottles of milk in the morning to keep cool and sweet until dinner hour. Marilla had seen and start off to school on the first day of September with many secret misgivings. And was such an odd girl. How would she get on with the other children? And how on earth would she ever manage to hold her tongue during school hours? Things went better than Marilla feared, however. And came home that evening in high spirits. I think I'm going to like school here, she announced. I don't think much of the master, through. He's all the time curling his mustache and making eyes at Prissy Andrews. Prissy is grown up, you know. She's 16 and she's studying for the entrance examination into Queen's Academy at Charlottetown next year. Tilly Bolter says the master is dead gone on her. She's got a beautiful complexion and curly brown hair and she does it up so elegantly. She sits in the long seat at the back and he sits there, too, most of the time, to explain her lessons, he says. But Ruby Gillis says she saw him writing something on her slate and when Prissy read it she blushed as red as a beet and giggled, and Ruby Gillis says she doesn't believe it had anything to do with the lesson. And Shirley, don't let me hear you talking about your teacher in that way again, said Marilla sharply. You don't go to school to criticize the master. I guess he can teach you something, and it's your business to learn. And I want you to understand right off that you are not to come home telling tales about him. That is something I won't encourage. I hope you were a good girl. Indeed I was, said uncomfortably. It wasn't so hard as you might imagine, either. I sit with Diana. Our seat is right by the window and we can look down to the lake of shining waters. There are a lot of nice girls in school and we had scrumptious fun playing at dinner time. It's so nice to have a lot of little girls to play with. But of course I like Diana best and always will. I adore Diana. I'm dreadfully far behind the others. They're all in the fifth book and I'm only in the fourth. I feel that it's kind of a disgrace. But there's not one of them has such an imagination as I have and I soon found that out. We had reading and geography and Canadian history and dictation today. Mr. Phillips said my spelling was disgraceful and he held up my slate so that everybody could see it, 
all marked over. I felt so mortified, Marilla, he might have been politer to a stranger, I think. Ruby Gillis gave me an apple and Sophia Sloan lent me a lovely pink card with May I See You Home. On it. I'm to give it back to her tomorrow. And Tilly Bolter let me wear her bead ring all the afternoon. Can I have some of those pearl beads off the old pin cushion in the garret to make myself a ring? And oh, Marilla, Jane Andrews told me that Minnie McPherson told her that she heard Prissy Andrews tell Sarah Gillis that I had a very pretty nose. Marilla, that is the first compliment I have ever had in my life and you can't imagine what a strange feeling it gave me. Marilla, have I really a pretty nose? I know you'll tell me the truth. Your nose is well enough, said Marilla shortly. Secretly she thought Anne's nose was a remarkable pretty one, but she had no intention of telling her so. That was three weeks ago and all had gone smoothly so far. And now, this crisp September morning, Anne and Diana were tripping blithely down the birch path, two of the happiest little girls in Avonlea. I guess Gilbert Blythe will be in school today, said Diana. He's been visiting his cousins over in New Brunswick all summer and he only came home Saturday night. He's awfully handsome, Anne. And he teases the girl something terrible. He just torments our lives out. Diana's voice indicated that she rather liked having her life tormented out than not. Gilbert Blythe, said Anne. Isn't his name that's written up on the porch wall with Julia Bells and a big take notice over them? Yes, said Diana, tossing her head, but I'm sure he doesn't like Julia Bell so very much. I've heard him say he studied the multiplication table by her freckles. Oh, don't speak about freckles to me, implored Anne. It isn't delicate when I've got so many. But I do think that writing take notices up on the wall about the boys and girls is the silliest ever. I should just like to see anybody dare to write my name up with a boys. Not, of course, she hastened to add, that anybody would. And sighed. She didn't want her name written up. But it was a little humiliating to know that there was no danger of it. Nonsense, said Diana whose black eyes and glossy tresses had played such havoc with the hearts of Avonlea schoolboys that her name figured on the porch walls in half a dozen take notices. It's only meant as a joke. And don't you be too sure your name won't ever be written up. Charlie Sloan is dead gone on you. He told his mother, his mother, mind you, that you were the smartest girl in school. That's better than being good-looking. No, it isn't, said Anne, feminine to the core. I'd rather be pretty than clever. And I hate Charlie Sloan, I can't bear a boy with goggle eyes. If anyone wrote my name up with his I'd never get over it, Diana Barry. But it is nice to keep head of your class. You'll have Gilbert in your class after this, said Diana, and he's used to being head of his class, I can tell you. He's only in the fourth book although he's nearly fourteen. Four years ago his father was sick and had to go out to Alberta for his health and Gilbert went with him. They were there three years and Gil didn't go to school hardly any until they came back. You won't find it so easy to keep head after this, Anne. I'm glad, said and quickly. I couldn't really feel proud of keeping head of little boys and girls of just nine or ten. I got up yesterday spelling evulsion. Josie Pye was head and, mind you, she peeped in her book. Mr. Phillips didn't see her, he was looking at Prissy Andrews, but I did. I just swept her a look of freezing scorn and she got as red as a beet and spelled it wrong after all. Those Pye girls are cheats all round, said Diana indignantly, as they climbed the fence of the main road. Gertie Pye actually went and put her milk bottle in my place in the brook yesterday. Did you ever? I don't speak to her now. When Mr. Phillips was in the back of the room hearing Prissy Andrews's Latin, Diana whispered to Anne, that's Gilbert Blythe sitting right across the aisle from you, Anne. Just look at him and see if you don't think he's handsome. And looked accordingly. She had a good chance to do so, for the said Gilbert Blythe was absorbed in stealthily pinning the long yellow braid of Ruby Gillis, who sat in front of him, to the back of her seat. He was a tall boy, with curly brown hair, roguish hazel eyes, and a mouth twisted into a teasing smile. Presently Ruby Gillis started up to take a sum to the master, she fell back into her seat with a little shriek, believing that her hair was pulled out by the roots. Everybody looked at her and Mr. Phillips glared so sternly that Ruby began to cry. Gilbert had whisked the pin out of sight and was studying his history with the soberest face in the world, but when the commotion subsided he looked at Anne and winked with inexpressible drollery. I think your Gilbert Blythe is handsome, confided Anne to Diana, but I think he's very bold. It isn't good manners to wink at a strange girl. But it was not until the afternoon that things really began to happen. Mr. Phillips was back in the corner explaining a problem in algebra to Prissy Andrews and the rest of the scholars were doing pretty much as they pleased eating green apples, whispering, drawing pictures on their slates, and driving crickets harnessed to strings, up and down aisle. 
Gilbert Blythe was trying to make Anne Shirley look at him and failing utterly, because Anne was at that moment totally oblivious not only to the very existence of Gilbert Blythe, but of every other scholar in Avonlea School itself. With her chin propped on her hands and her eyes fixed on the blue glimpse of the lake of shining waters that the west window afforded, she was far away in a gorgeous dreamland hearing and seeing nothing save her own wonderful visions. Gilbert Blythe wasn't used to putting himself out to make a girl look at him in meeting with failure. She should look at him, that red-haired Shirley girl with the little pointed chin and the big eyes that weren't like the eyes of any other girl in Avonlea School. Gilbert reached across the aisle, picked up the end of Anne's long red braid, held it out at arm's length and said in a piercing whisper. Carrots. Carrots. Then and looked at him with a vengeance. She did more than look. She sprang to her feet, her bright fancies fallen into cureless ruin. She flashed one indignant glance at Gilbert from eyes whose angry sparkle was swiftly quenched in equally angry tears. You mean, hateful boy, she exclaimed passionately. How dare you? And then, thwack. And had brought her slate down on Gilbert's head and cracked it, slate not head, clear across. Avonlea school always enjoyed a scene. This was an especially enjoyable one. Everybody said oh in horrified delight. Diana gasped. Ruby Gillis, who was inclined to be hysterical, began to cry. Tommy Sloan let his team of crickets escape him altogether while he stared open-mouthed at the tableau. Mr. Phillips stalked down the aisle and laid his hand heavily on Anne's shoulder. And surely, what does this mean? He said angrily. And returned no answer. It was asking too much of flesh and blood to expect her to tell before the whole school that she had been called carrots. Gilbert it was who spoke up stoutly. It was my fault Mr. Phillips. I teased her. Mr. Phillips paid no heed to Gilbert. I am sorry to see a pupil of mine displaying such a temper and such a vindictive spirit, he said in a solemn tone, as if the mere fact of being a pupil of his ought to root out all evil passions from the hearts of small and perfect mortals. And, go and stand on the platform in front of the blackboard for the rest of the afternoon. And would have infinitely preferred a whipping to this punishment under which her sensitive spirit quivered as from a whiplash. With a white, set face she obeyed. Mr. Phillips took a chalk crayon and wrote on the blackboard above her head. And Shirley has a very bad temper. And Shirley must learn to control her temper, and then read it out loud so that even the primer class, who couldn't read writing, should understand it. And stood there the rest of the afternoon with that legend above her. She did not cry or hang her head. Anger was still too hot in her heart for that and it sustained her amid all her agony of humiliation. With resentful eyes and passion red cheeks she confronted alike Diana's sympathetic gaze and Charlie Sloane's indignant nods and Josie Pye's malicious smiles. As for Gilbert Blythe, she would not even look at him. She would never look at him again. She would never speak to him. When school was dismissed and marched out with her red head held high, Gilbert Blythe tried to intercept her at the porch door. I'm awfully sorry I made fun of your hair, Anne, he whispered contritely. Honest I am. Don't be mad for keeps, now. And swept by disdainfully, without look or sign of hearing. Oh how could you, Anne? breathed Diana as they went down the road half reproachfully, half admiringly. Diana felt that she could never have resisted Gilbert's plea. I shall never forgive Gilbert Blythe, said in firmly. And Mr. Phillips spelled my name without an E, too. The iron has entered into my soul, Diana. Diana hadn't the least idea what it meant but she understood it was something terrible. You mustn't mind Gilbert making fun of your hair, she said soothingly. Why, he makes fun of all the girls. He laughs at mine because it's so black. He's called me a crow a dozen times, and I never heard him apologize for anything before, either. There's a great deal of difference between being called a crow and being called carrots, said Anne with dignity. Gilbert Blythe has hurt my feelings excruciatingly, Diana. It is possible the matter might have blown over without more excruciation if nothing else had happened. But when things begin to happen they are apt to keep on. Avonlea scholars often spent noon hour picking gum in Mr. Bell's spruce grove over the hill and across his big pasture field. From there they could keep an eye on Evan Wright's house, where the master boarded. When they saw Mr. Phillips emerging therefrom they ran for the schoolhouse, but the distance being about three times longer than Mr. Wright's lane they were very apt to arrive there, breathless and gasping, some three minutes too late. On the following day Mr. Phillips was seized with one of his spasmodic fits of reform and announced before going home to dinner, that he should expect to find all the scholars in their seats when he returned. Anyone who came in late would be punished. All the boys and some of the girls went to Mr. Bell's Spruce Grove as usual, fully intending to stay only long enough to pick a chew. But spruce groves are seductive and yellow nuts of gum beguiling, they picked and loitered and strayed, 
and as usual the first thing that recalled them to a sense of the flight of time was Jimmy Glover shouting from the top of a patriarchal old spruce master's coming. The girls who were on the ground, started first and managed to reach the schoolhouse in time but without a second to spare. The boys, who had to wriggle hastily down from the trees, were later, and Anne, who had not been picking gum at all but was wandering happily in the far end of the grove, way steep among the bracken, singing softly to herself, with a wreath of rice lilies on her hair as if she were some wild divinity of the shadowy places, was latest of all. And could run like a deer, however, run she did with the impish result that she overtook the boys at the door and was swept into the schoolhouse among them just as Mr. Phillips was in the act of hanging up his hat. Mr. Phillips's brief reforming energy was over, he didn't want the bother of punishing a dozen pupils, but it was necessary to do something to save his word, so he looked about for a scapegoat and found it in Anne, who had dropped into her seat, gasping for breath, with a forgotten lily wreath hanging askew over one ear and giving her a particularly rakish and disheveled appearance. And surely, since you seem to be so fond of the boy's company we shall indulge your taste for it this afternoon, he said sarcastically. Take those flowers out of your hair and sit with Gilbert Blythe. The other boys snickered. Diana, turning pale with pity, plucked the wreath from Anne's hair and squeezed her hand. And stared at the master as if turned to stone. Did you hear what I said, Anne? queried Mr. Phillips sternly. Yes, sir, said and slowly but I didn't suppose you really meant it. I assure you I did still with the sarcastic inflection which all the children, and and especially, hated. It flicked on the raw. Obey me at once. For a moment and looked as if she meant to disobey. Then, realizing that there was no help for it, she rose haughtily, stepped across the aisle, sat down beside Gilbert Blythe, and buried her face in her arms on the desk. Ruby Gillis, who got a glimpse of it as it went down, told the others going home from school that she'd actually never seen anything like it, it was so white, with awful little red spots in it. To Anne, this was as the end of all things. It was bad enough to be singled out for punishment from among a dozen equally guilty ones, it was worse still to be sent to sit with a boy, but that that boy should be Gilbert Blythe was heaping insult on injury to a degree utterly unbearable. And felt that she could not bear it and it would be of no use to try. Her whole being seethed with shame and anger and humiliation. At first the other scholars looked and whispered and giggled and nudged. But as Anne never lifted her head and as Gilbert worked fractions as if his whole soul was absorbed in them and them only, they soon returned to their own tasks and Anne was forgotten. When Mr. Phillips called the history class out and should have gone, but Anne did not move, and Mr. Phillips, who had been writing some verses to Priscilla before he called the class, was thinking about an obstinate rhyme still and never missed her. Once, when nobody was looking, Gilbert took from his desk a little pink candy heart with a gold motto on it, You are sweet, and slipped it under the curve of Anne's arm. Whereupon Anne arose, took the pink heart gingerly between the tips of her fingers, dropped it on the floor, ground it to powder beneath her heel, and resumed her position without deigning to bestow a glance on Gilbert. When school went out and marched to her desk, ostentatiously took out everything therein, books and writing tablet, pen and ink, testament and arithmetic, and piled them neatly on her cracked slate. What are you taking all those things home for, Anne? Diana wanted to know, as soon as they were out on the road. She had not dared to ask the question before. I am not coming back to school any more, said Anne. Diana gasped and stared at Anne to see if she meant it. Will Marilla let you stay home? She asked. She'll have to, said Anne. I'll never go to school to that man again. Oh. Diana looked as if she were ready to cry. I do think you're mean. What shall I do? Mr. Phillips will make me sit with that horrid Gertie Pie, I know he will because she is sitting alone. Do come back, Anne. I do almost anything in the world for you, Diana, said and sadly. I'd let myself be torn limb from limb if it would do you any good. But I can't do this so, so please don't ask it. You harrow up my very soul. Just think of all the fun you will miss, mourned Diana. We are going to build the loveliest new house down by the brook, and we'll be playing ball next week and you've never played ball, Anne. It's tremendously exciting. And we're going to learn a new song, Jane Andrews is practicing it up now, and Alice Andrews is going to bring a new pansy book next week and we're all going to read it out loud, chapter about, down by the brook. And you know you are so fond of reading out loud, Anne. Nothing moved Anne in the least. Her mind was made up. She would not go to school to Mr. Phillips again, she told Marilla so when she got home. Nonsense, said Marilla. It isn't nonsense at all, said Anne, gazing at Marilla with solemn, reproachful eyes. Don't you understand, Marilla? I've been insulted. Insulted fiddlesticks. You'll go to school tomorrow as usual. 
Oh no. And shook her head gently. I'm not going back, Marilla. I'll learn my lessons at home and I'll be as good as I can be and hold my tongue all the time if it's possible at all. But I will not go back to school, I assure you. Marilla saw something remarkably like unyielding stubbornness looking out of Anne's small face. She understood that she would have trouble in overcoming it, but she resolved wisely to say nothing more just then. I'll run down and see Rachel about it this evening, she thought. There's no use reasoning with Anne now. She's too worked up and I've an idea she can be awful stubborn if she takes the notion. Far as I can make out from her story, Mr. Phillips has been carrying matters with a rather high hand. But it would never do to say so to her. I'll just talk it over with Rachel. She sent ten children to school and she ought to know something about it. She'll have heard the whole story, too, by this time. Marilla found Mrs. Lynn knitting quilts as industriously and cheerfully as usual. I suppose you know what I've come about, she said, a little shamefacedly. Mrs. Rachel nodded. About Anne's fuss in school, I reckoned, she said. Tilly Boulter was in on her way home from school and told me about it. I don't know what to do with her, said Marilla. She declares she won't go back to school. I never saw a child so worked up. I've been expecting trouble ever since she started to school. I knew things were going too smooth to last. She's so high-strung. What would you advise, Rachel? Well, since you've asked my advice, Marilla, said Mrs. Lynde amiably, Mrs. Lynde dearly loved to be asked for advice, I just humor her a little at first, that's what I do. It's my belief that Mr. Phillips was in the wrong. Of course, it doesn't do to say so to the children, you know. And of course he did right to punish her yesterday for giving way to temper. But today it was different. The others who were late should have been punished as well as Anne, that's what. And I don't believe in making the girls sit with the boys for punishment. It isn't modest. Tilly Boulter was real indignant. She took Anne's part right through and said all the scholars did too. And seems real popular among them, somehow. I never thought she'd take with them so well. Then you really think I'd better let her stay home, said Marilla in amazement. Yes. That is I wouldn't say school to her again until she said it herself. Depend upon it, Marilla, she'll cool off in a week or so and be ready enough to go back of her own accord, that's what, while, if you were to make her go back right off, dear knows what freak or tantrum she'd take next and make more trouble than ever. The less fuss made the better, in my opinion. She won't miss much by not going to school, as far as that goes. Mr. Phillips isn't any good at all as a teacher. The order he keeps is scandalous, that's what, and he neglects the young fry and puts all his time on those big scholars he's getting ready for Queen's. He'd never have got the school for another year if his uncle hadn't been a trustee, the trustee, for he just leads the other two around by the nose, that's what. I declare, I don't know what education in this island is coming to. Mrs. Rachel shook her head, as much as to say if she were only at the head of the educational system of the province things would be much better managed. Marilla took Mrs. Rachel's advice and not another word was said to Anne about going back to school. She learned her lessons at home, did her chores, and played with Diana in the chilly purple autumn twilights, but when she met Gilbert Blythe on the road or encountered him in Sunday school she passed him by with an icy contempt that was no whit thawed by his evident desire to appease her. Even Diana's efforts as a peacemaker were of no avail. And had evidently made up her mind to hate Gilbert Blythe to the end of life. As much as she hated Gilbert, however, did she love Diana, with all the love of her passionate little heart, equally intense in its likes and dislikes. One evening Marilla, coming in from the orchard with a basket of apples, found and sitting along by the east window in the twilight, crying bitterly. Whatever's the matter now, Anne? She asked. It's about Diana, sobbed in luxuriously. I love Diana so, Marilla. I cannot ever live without her. But I know very well when we grow up that Diana will get married and go away and leave me. And oh, what shall I do? I hate her husband, I just hate him furiously. I've been imagining it all out, the wedding and everything. Diana dressed in snowy garments, with a veil, and looking as beautiful and regal as a queen, and me the bridesmaid, with a lovely dress too, and puffed sleeves, but with a breaking heart hid beneath my smiling face. And then bidding Diana goodbye ee, -e, here and broke down entirely and wept with increasing bitterness. Marilla turned quickly away to hide her twitching face, but it was no use, she collapsed on the nearest chair and burst into such a hearty and unusual peal of laughter that Matthew, crossing the yard outside, halted in amazement. When had he heard Marilla laugh like that before? Well, and surely, said Marilla as soon as she could speak, if you must borrow trouble, for pity's sake borrow it handier home. I should think you had an imagination, sure enough. Dash. Chapter 16. Diana is invited to tea with tragic results. 
October was a beautiful month at Green Gables, when the birches in the hollow turned as golden as sunshine and the maples behind the orchard were royal crimson and the wild cherry trees along the lane put on the loveliest shades of dark red and bronzy green, while the fields sunned themselves in aftermaths. Anne reveled in the world of colour about her. Oh Arilla, she exclaimed one Saturday morning, coming dancing in with her arms full of gorgeous boughs, I'm so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers. It would be terrible if we just skipped from September to November, wouldn't it? Look at these maple branches. Don't they give you a thrill, several thrills? I'm going to decorate my room with them. Messy things, said Marilla, whose aesthetic sense was not noticeably developed. You clutter up your room entirely too much with out-of-doors stuff, Anne. Bedrooms were made to sleep in. Oh, and dream in too, Marilla. And you know one can dream so much better in a room where there are pretty things. I'm going to put these boughs in the old blue jug and set them on my table. Mind you don't drop leaves all over the stairs then. I'm going on a meeting of the Aid Society at Carmody this afternoon, and, and I won't likely be home before dark. You'll have to get Matthew and Jerry their supper, so mind you don't forget to put the tea to draw until you sit down at the table as you did last time. It was dreadful of me to forget, said in apologetically, but that was the afternoon I was trying to think of a name for Violet Vale and it crowded other things out. Matthew was so good. He never scolded a bit. He put the tea down himself and said we could wait a while as well as not. And I told him a lovely fairy story while we were waiting, so he didn't find the time long at all. It was a beautiful fairy story, Marilla. I forgot the end of it, so I made up an end for it myself and Matthew said he couldn't tell where the join came in. Matthew would think it all right, Anne, if you took a notion to get up and have dinner in the middle of the night. But you keep your wits about you this time. Anne, I don't really know if I'm doing right, it may make you more adulpated than ever, but you can ask Diana to come over and spend the afternoon with you and have tea here. Oh, Rilla. And clasped her hands. How perfectly lovely. You are able to imagine things after all or else you'd never have understood how I've longed for that very thing. It will seem so nice and grown-upish. No fear of my forgetting to put the tea to draw when I have company. Oh, Arilla, can I use the rosebud spray tea set? No, indeed. The rosebud tea set. Well, what next? You know I never use that except for the minister or the aides. You'll put down the old brown tea set. But you can open the little yellow crock of cherry preserves. It's time it was being used anyhow, I believe it's beginning to work. And you can cut some fruit cake and have some of the cookies and snaps. I can just imagine myself sitting down at the head of the table and pouring out the tea, said Anne, shutting her eyes ecstatically. And asking Diana if she takes sugar. I know she doesn't but of course I'll ask her just as if I didn't know. And then pressing her to take another piece of fruit cake and another helping of preserves. Oh Arilla, it's a wonderful sensation just to think of it. Can I take her into the spare room to lay off her hat when she comes? And then into the parlor to sit? No. The sitting room will do for you and your company but there's a bottle half full of raspberry cordial that was left over from the church social the other night. It's on the second shelf of the sitting room closet and you and Diana can have it if you like, and a cookie to eat with it along in the afternoon, for I dare say Matthew will be late coming into tea since he's hauling potatoes to the vessel. And flew down to the hollow, past the dried's bubble and up the spruce path to Orchard Slope, to ask Diana to tea. As a result just after Marilla had driven off to Carmody, Diana came over, dressed in her second best dress and looking exactly as it is proper to look when asked out to tea. At other times she was wont to run into the kitchen without knocking, but now she knocked primly at the front door. And when Anne, dressed in her second best, as primly opened it, both little girls shook hands as gravely as if they had never met before. This unnatural solemnity lasted until after Diana had been taken to the east gable to lay off her hat and then had sat for ten minutes in the sitting room, toes in position. How is your mother? inquired and politely, just as if she had not seen Mrs. Barry picking apples that morning in excellent health and spirits. She is very well, thank you. I suppose Mr. Cuthbert is hauling potatoes to the lily sands this afternoon, is he? said Diana, who had ridden down to Mr. Harmon Andrews as that morning in Matthew's cart. Yes. Our potato crop is very good this year. I hope your father's crop is good too. It is fairly good, thank you. Have you picked many of your apples yet? Oh, ever so many, said Anne forgetting to be dignified and jumping up quickly. Let's go out to the orchard and get some of the red sweetings, Diana. Marilla says we can have all that are left on the tree. Marilla is a very generous woman. She said we could have fruit cake and cherry preserves for tea. But it isn't good manners to tell your company what you are going to give them to eat, so I won't tell you what she said we could have to drink. 
only it begins with an R and a C and it's bright red color. I love bright red drinks, don't you? They taste twice as good as any other color. The orchard, with its great sweeping boughs that bent to the ground with fruit, proved so delightful that the little girls spent most of the afternoon in it, sitting in a grassy corner where the frost had spared the green and the mellow autumn sunshine lingered warmly, eating apples and talking as hard as they could. Diana had much to tell Anne of what went on in school. She had to sit with Gertie Pye and she hated it. Gertie squeaked her pencil all the time and it just made her, Diana's, blood run cold, Ruby Gillis had charmed all her warts away, true's you live, with a magic pebble that old Mary Jo from the creek gave her. You had to rub the warts with the pebble and then throw it away over your left shoulder at the time of the new moon and the warts would all go. Charlie Sloan's name was written up with M. White's on the porch wall and M. White was awful mad about it. Sam Bolter had sassed Mr. Phillips in class and Mr. Phillips whipped him and Sam's father came down to the school and dared Mr. Phillips to lay a hand on one of his children again, and Maddie Andrews had a new red hood and a blue crossover with tassels on it and the airs she put on about it were perfectly sickening, and Lizzie Wright didn't speak to Mamie Wilson because Mamie Wilson's grown-up sister had cut out Lizzie Wright's grown-up sister with her bow, and everybody missed in so and wished she's come to school again, and Gilbert Blythe. But Anne didn't want to hear about Gilbert Blythe. She jumped up hurriedly and said suppose they go in and have some raspberry cordial. And looked on the second shelf of the room pantry but there was no bottle of raspberry cordial there. Search revealed it away back on the top shelf. And put it on a tray and set it on the table with a tumbler. Now, please help yourself, Diana, she said politely. I don't believe I'll have any just now. I don't feel as if I wanted any after all those apples. Diana poured herself out a tumblerful, looked at its bright red hue admiringly, and then sipped it daintily. That's awfully nice raspberry cordial, Anne, she said. I didn't know raspberry cordial was so nice. I'm real glad you like it. Take as much as you want. I'm going to run out and stir the fire up. There are so many responsibilities on a person's mind when they're keeping house, isn't there? When Anne came back from the kitchen Diana was drinking her second glass full of cordial, and, being entreated thereto by Anne, she offered no particular objection to the drinking of a third. The tumblerfuls were generous ones and the raspberry cordial was certainly very nice. The nicest I ever drank, said Diana. It's ever so much nicer than Mrs. Lynn's, although she brags of hers so much. It doesn't taste a bit like hers. I should think Marilla's raspberry cordial would probably be much nicer than Mrs. Lynn's, said him loyally. Marilla is a famous cook. She is trying to teach me to cook but I assure you, Diana, it is uphill work. There's so little scope for imagination in cookery. You just have to go by rules. The last time I made a cake I forgot to put the flour in. I was thinking the loveliest story about you and me, Diana. I thought you were desperately ill with smallpox and everybody deserted you, but I went boldly to your bedside and nursed you back to life, and then I took the smallpox and died and I was buried under those poplar trees in the graveyard and you planted a rose bush by my grave and watered it with your tears, and you never, never forgot the friend of your youth who sacrificed her life for you. Oh, it was such a pathetic tale, Diana. The tears just rained down over my cheeks while I mixed the cake. But I forgot the flour and the cake was a dismal failure. Flour is so essential to cakes, you know. Marilla was very cross and I don't wonder. I'm a great trial to her. She was terribly mortified about the pudding sauce last week. We had a plum pudding for dinner on Tuesday and there was half the pudding and a pitcher full of sauce left over. Marilla said there was enough for another dinner and told me to set it on the pantry shelf and cover it. I meant to cover it just as much as could be, Diana but when I carried it in I was imagining I was a nun, of course I'm a Protestant but I imagined I was a Catholic, taking the veil to bury a broken heart in cloistered seclusion, and I forgot all about covering the pudding sauce. I thought of it next morning and ran to the pantry. Diana, fancy if you can my extreme horror at finding a mouse drowned in that pudding sauce. I lifted the mouse out with a spoon and threw it out in the yard and then I washed the spoon in three waters. Marilla was out milking and I fully intended to ask her when she came in if I'd give the sauce to the pigs, but when she did come in I was imagining that I was a frost fairy going through the woods turning the trees red and yellow, whichever they wanted to be, so I never thought about the pudding sauce again and Marilla sent me out to pick apples. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Chester Ross from Spencervale came here that morning. You know they are very stylish people, especially Mrs. Chester Ross. When Marilla called me and dinner was all ready and everybody was at the table. I tried to be as polite and dignified as I could be, for I wanted Mrs. Chester Ross to think I was a ladylike little girl even if I wasn't pretty. Everything went right until I saw Marilla coming with the plum pudding in one hand and the pitcher of pudding sauce warmed up, in the other. Diana, that was a terrible moment. I remembered everything and I just stood up in my place and shrieked out Marilla, you mustn't use that pudding sauce. 
There was a mouse drowned in it. I forgot to tell you before. Oh, Anna, I shall never forget that awful moment if I live to be a hundred. Mrs. Chester Ross just looked at me and I thought I would sink through the floor with mortification. She is such a perfect housekeeper and fancy what she must have thought of us. Marilla turned red as fire but she never said a word, then. She just carried that sauce and pudding out and brought in some strawberry preserves. She even offered me some, but I couldn't swallow a mouthful. It was like heaping coals of fire on my head. After Mrs. Chester Ross went away, Marilla gave me a dreadful scolding. Why, Diana, what is the matter? Diana had stood up very unsteadily, then she sat down again, putting her hands to her head. I'm, I'm awful sick, she said, a little thickly. I, I, must go right home. Oh, you mustn't dream of going home without your tea, cried Anne in distress. I'll get it right off, I'll go and put the tea down this very minute. I must go home, repeated Diana, stupidly but determinedly. Let me get you a lunch anyhow, implored Anne. Let me give you a bit of fruit cake and some of the cherry preserves. Lie down on the sofa for a little while and you'll be better. Where do you feel bad? I must go home, said Diana, and that was all she would say. In vain and pleaded. I never heard of company going home without tea, she mourned. Oh Anna, do you suppose that it's possible you're really taking the smallpox? If you are I'll go and nurse you, you can depend on that. I'll never forsake you. But I do wish you'd stay till after tea. Where do you feel bad? I'm awful dizzy, said Diana. And indeed, she walked very dizzily. And, with tears of disappointment in her eyes, got Diana's hat and went with her as far as the berry yard fence. Then she wept all the way back to Green Gables, where she sorrowfully put the remainder of the raspberry cordial back into the pantry and got tea ready for Matthew and Jerry, with all the zest gone out of the performance. The next day was Sunday and as the rain poured down in torrents from dawn till dusk and did not stir abroad from Green Gables. Monday afternoon Marilla sent her down to Mrs. Lynn's on an errand. In a very short space of time and came flying back up the lane with tears rolling down her cheeks. Into the kitchen she dashed and flung herself face downward on the sofa in an agony. Whatever has gone wrong now, Anne? queried Marilla in doubt and dismay. I do hope you haven't gone and been saucy to Mrs. Lynde again. No answer from and save more tears and stormier sobs. And surely, when I ask you a question I want to be answered. Sit right up this very minute and tell me what you are crying about. And sat up, tragedy personified. Mrs. Lynde was up to see Mrs. Barry today and Mrs. Barry was in an awful state, she wailed. She says that I set Diana drunk Saturday and sent her home in a disgraceful condition. And she says I must be a thoroughly bad, wicked little girl and she's never, never going to let Diana play with me again. Oh Marilla, I'm just overcome with woe. Marilla stared in blank amazement. Set Diana drunk, she said when she found her voice. And are you or Mrs. Barry crazy? What on earth did you give her? Not a thing but raspberry cordial, sobbed in. I never thought raspberry cordial would set people drunk, Marilla, not even if they drank three big tumblerfuls as Diana did. Oh, it sounds so, so, like Mrs. Thomas's husband. But I didn't mean to set her drunk. Drunk fiddlesticks, said Marilla, marching to the sitting room pantry. There on the shelf was a bottle which she at once recognized as one containing some of her three-year-old homemade currant wine for which she was celebrated in Avonlea, although certain of the stricter sort, Mrs. Barry among them, disapproved strongly of it. And at the same time Marilla recollected that she had put the bottle of raspberry cordial down in the cellar instead of in the pantry as she had told Anne. She went back to the kitchen with the wine bottle in her hand. Her face was twitching in spite of herself. Anne, you certainly have a genius for getting into trouble. You went and gave Diana currant wine instead of raspberry cordial. Didn't you know the difference yourself? I never tasted it, said Anne. I thought it was the cordial. I meant to be so, so, hospitable. Diana got awfully sick and had to go home. Mrs. Barry told Mrs. Lynn she was simply dead drunk. She just laughed silly-like when her mother asked her what was the matter and went to sleep and slept for hours. Her mother smelled her breath and knew she was drunk. She had a fearful headache all day yesterday. Mrs. Barry is so indignant. She will never believe but what I did it on purpose. I should think she would better punish Diana for being so greedy as to drink three glassfuls of anything, said Marilla shortly. Why, three of those big glasses would have made her sick even if it had only been cordial. Well, this story will be a nice handle for those folks who are so down on me for making currant wine, although I haven't made any for three years ever since I found out that the minister didn't approve. I just kept that bottle for sickness. There, there, child, don't cry. I can't see as you were to blame although I'm sorry it happened so. 
I must cry, said Anne. My heart is broken. The stars in their courses fight against me, Marilla. Diana and I are parted forever. Oh, Marilla, I little dreamed of this when first we swore our vows of friendship. Don't be foolish, Anne. Mrs. Barry will think better of it when she finds you're not to blame. I suppose she thinks you've done it for a silly joke or something of that sort. You'd best go up this evening and tell her how it was. My courage fails me at the thought of facing Diana's injured mother, sighed Anne. I wish you'd go, Marilla. You're so much more dignified than I am. Likely she'd listen to you quicker than to me. Well, I will, said Marilla, reflecting that it would probably be the wiser course. Don't cry any more, Anne. It will be all right. Marilla had changed her mind about it being all right by the time she got back from Orchard Slope. Anne was watching for her coming and flew to the porch door to meet her. Oh, Marilla, I know by your face that it's been no use, she said sorrowfully. Mrs. Barry won't forgive me? Mrs. Barry indeed, snapped Marilla. Of all the unreasonable women I ever saw she's the worst. I told her it was all a mistake and you weren't to blame, but she just simply didn't believe me. And she rubbed it well in about my currant wine and how it always said it couldn't have the least effect on anybody. I just told her plainly that currant wine wasn't meant to be drunk three tumblerfuls at a time and that if a child I had to do with was so greedy I'd sober her up with a right good spanking. Marilla whisked into the kitchen, grievously disturbed, leaving a very much distracted little soul in the porch behind her. Presently Anne stepped out bareheaded into the chill autumn dusk, very determinedly and steadily she took her way down through the sear clover field over the log bridge and up through the spruce grove, lighted by a pale little moon hanging low over the western woods. Mrs. Barry, coming to the door in answer to a timid knock, found a white-lipped eager-eyed suppliant on the doorstep. Her face hardened. Mrs. Barry was a woman of strong prejudices and dislikes, and her anger was of the cold, sullen sort which is always hardest to overcome. To do her justice, she really believed and had made Diana drunk out of sheer malice propense, and she was honestly anxious to preserve her little daughter from the contamination of further intimacy with such a child. What do you want? She said stiffly. And clasped her hands. Oh, Mrs. Barry, please forgive me. I did not mean to, to, intoxicate Diana. How could I? Just imagine if you were a poor little orphan girl that kind people had adopted and you had just one bosom friend in all the world. Do you think you would intoxicate her on purpose? I thought it was only raspberry cordial. I was firmly convinced it was raspberry cordial. Oh, please don't say that you won't let Diana play with me any more. If you do you will cover my life with a dark cloud of woe. This speech which would have softened good Mrs. Lynn's heart in a twinkling, had no effect on Mrs. Barry except to irritate her still more. She was suspicious of Anne's big words and dramatic gestures and imagined that the child was making fun of her. So she said, coldly and cruelly. I don't think you are a fit little girl for Diana to associate with. You'd better go home and behave yourself. Anne's lips quivered. Won't you let me see Diana just once to say farewell? She implored. Diana has gone over to Carmody with her father, said Mrs. Barry, going in and shutting the door. And went back to Green Gables calm with despair. My last hope is gone, she told Marilla. I went up and saw Mrs. Barry myself and she treated me very insultingly. Marilla, I do not think she is a well-bred woman. There is nothing more to do except to pray and I haven't much hope that that'll do much good because, Marilla, I do not believe that God himself can do very much with such an obstinate person as Mrs. Barry. And, you shouldn't say such things rebuked Marilla, striving to overcome that unholy tendency to laughter which she was dismayed to find growing upon her. And indeed, when she told the whole story to Matthew that night, she did laugh heartily over Anne's tribulations. But when she slipped into the east gable before going to bed and found that Anne had cried herself to sleep an unaccustomed softness crept into her face. Poor little soul, she murmured, lifting a loose curl of hair from the child's tear-stained face. Then she bent down and kissed the flushed cheek on the pillow. Dash. Chapter 17. A New Interest in Life. The next afternoon Anne, bending over her patchwork at the kitchen window, happened to glance out and beheld Diana down by the dryad's bubble beckoning mysteriously. In a trice Anne was out of the house and flying down to the hollow, astonishment and hope struggling in her expressive eyes. But the hope faded when she saw Diana's dejected countenance. Your mother hasn't relented? She gasped. Diana shook her head mournfully. No, and oh, Anne, she says I'm never to play with you again. I've cried and cried and I told her it wasn't your fault, but it wasn't any use. I had ever such a time coaxing her to let me come down and say goodbye to you. She said I was only to stay ten minutes and she's timing me by the clock. 
Ten minutes isn't very long to say an eternal farewell in, said in tearfully. Oh, Anna, will you promise faithfully never to forget me, the friend of your youth, no matter what dearer friends may caress thee? Indeed I will, sobbed Diana, and I'll never have another bosom friend, I don't want to have. I couldn't love anybody as I love you. Oh, Anna, cried Anne, clasping her hands, do you love me? Why, of course I do. Didn't you know that? No. And drew a long breath. I thought you liked me of course but I never hoped you loved me. Why, Diana, I didn't think anybody could love me. Nobody ever has loved me since I can remember. Oh, this is wonderful. It's a ray of light which will forever shine on the darkness of a path severed from thee, Diana. Oh, just say it once again. I love you devotedly, Anne, said Diana staunchly, and I always will, you may be sure of that. And I will always love thee, Diana, said Anne, solemnly extending her hand. In the years to come thy memory will shine like a star over my lonely life, as that last story we read together says. Diana, wilt thou give me a lock of thy jet-black tresses and parting to treasure forevermore? Have you got anything to cut it with? queried Diana, wiping away the tears which Anne's affecting accents had caused to flow afresh, and returning to practicalities. Yes. I've got my patchwork scissors in my apron pocket fortunately, said Anne. She solemnly clipped one of Diana's curls. Fare thee well, my beloved friend. Henceforth we must be as strangers though living side by side. But my heart will ever be faithful to thee. Anne stood and watched Diana out of sight, mournfully waving her hand to the latter whenever she turned to look back. Then she returned to the house, not a little consoled for the time being by this romantic parting. It is all over, she informed Marilla. I shall never have another friend. I'm really worse off than ever before, for I haven't Katie Maurice and Violetta now. And even if I had it wouldn't be the same. Somehow, little dream girls are not satisfying after a real friend. Diana and I had such an affecting farewell down by the spring. It will be sacred in my memory forever. I used the most pathetic language I could think of and said thou and thee. Thou and thee seem so much more romantic than you. Diana gave me a lock of her hair and I'm going to sew it up in a little bag and wear it around my neck all my life. Please see that it is buried with me, for I don't believe I'll live very long. Perhaps when she sees me lying cold and dead before her Mrs. Barry may feel remorse for what she has done and will let Diana come to my funeral. I don't think there is much fear of your dying of grief as long as you can talk, and, said Marilla unsympathetically. The following Monday Anne surprised Marilla by coming down from her room with her basket of books on her arm and hip and her lips primmed up into a line of determination. I'm going back to school, she announced. That is all there is left in life for me, now that my friend has been ruthlessly torn from me. In school I can look at her and muse over days departed. You'd better muse over your lessons and sums, said Marilla, concealing her delight at this development of the situation. If you're going back to school I hope we'll hear no more of breaking slates over people's heads and such carryings on. Behave yourself and do just what your teacher tells you. I'll try to be a model pupil, agreed in dolefully. There won't be much fun in it, I expect. Mr. Phillips said Minnie Andrews was a model pupil and there isn't a spark of imagination or life in her. She is just dull and pokey and never seems to have a good time. But I feel so depressed that perhaps it will come easy to me now. I'm going round by the road. I couldn't bear to go by the birch path all alone. I should weep bitter tears if I did. Anne was welcomed back to school with open arms. Her imagination had been sorely missed in games, her voice in the singing and her dramatic ability in the perusal aloud of books at dinner hour. Ruby Gillis smuggled three blue plums over to her during testament reading, Ella Mae McPherson gave her an enormous yellow pansy cut from the covers of a floral catalogue, a species of desk decoration much prized in Avonlea School. Sophia Sloan offered to teach her a perfectly elegant new pattern of knit lace, so nice for trimming aprons. Katie Bolter gave her a perfume bottle to keep slate water in, and Julia Bell copied carefully on a piece of pale pink paper scalloped on the edges the following effusion. When twilight drops her curtain down and pins it with a star remember that you have a friend though she may wander far. It's so nice to be appreciated, sighed and rapturously to Marilla that night. The girls were not the only scholars who appreciated her. When and went to her seat after dinner hour, she had been told by Mr. Phillips to sit with the model Minnie Andrews, she found on her desk a big luscious strawberry apple. And caught it up all ready to take a bite when she remembered that the only place in Avonlea where strawberry apples grew was in the old Blythe Orchard on the other side of the Lake of Shining Waters. And dropped the apple as if it were a red-hot coal and ostentatiously wiped her fingers on her handkerchief. The apple lay untouched on her desk until the next morning, when little Timothy Andrews, who swept the school and kindled the fire, annexed it as one of his perquisites. 
Charlie Sloan slate pencil, gorgeously bedizened with striped red and yellow paper, costing two cents where ordinary pencils cost only one, which he sent up to her after dinner hour, met with a more favorable reception. And was graciously pleased to accept it and rewarded the donor with a smile which exalted that infatuated youth straightway into the seventh heaven of delight and caused him to make such fearful errors in his dictation that Mr. Phillips kept him in after school to rewrite it. But as the Caesar's pageant shorn of Brutus bust did but of Rome's best son remind her more. So the marked absence of any tribute or recognition from Diana Barry who was sitting with Gertie Pye embittered Anne's little triumph. Diana might just have smiled at me once, I think, she mourned to Marilla that night. But the next morning a note most fearfully and wonderfully twisted and folded, and a small parcel were passed across to Anne. Dear Anne, ran the former. Mother says I'm not to play with you or talk to you even in school. It isn't my fault and don't be cross at me, because I love you as much as ever. I miss you awfully to tell all my secrets to and I don't like Gertie Pie one bit. I made you one of the new bookmarkers out of red tissue paper. They are awfully fashionable now and only three girls in school know how to make them. When you look at it remember. Your true friend. Diana Berry. And read the note, kiss the bookmark, and dispatched a prompt reply back to the other side of the school. My own darling Diana. Of course I am not cross at you because you have to obey your mother. Our spirits can commune. I shall keep your lovely present forever. Minnie Andrews is a very nice little girl, although she has no imagination, but after having been Diana's bussum friend I cannot be Minnie's. Please excuse mistakes because my spelling isn't very good yet, although much improved. Yours until death us do part. Anne or Cordelia Shirley. P.S. I shall sleep with your letter under my pillow tonight. A. Or see us. Marilla pessimistically expected more trouble since and had again begun to go to school. But none developed. Perhaps and caught something of the model spirit from Minnie Andrews, at least she got on very well with Mr. Phillips thenceforth. She flung herself into her studies heart and soul, determined not to be outdone in any class by Gilbert Blythe. The rivalry between them was soon apparent, it was entirely good-natured on Gilbert's side, but it is much to be feared that the same thing cannot be said of Anne, who had certainly an unpraiseworthy tenacity for holding grudges. She was as intense in her hatreds as in her loves. She would not stoop to admit that she meant to rival Gilbert in schoolwork, because that would have been to acknowledge his existence which Anne persistently ignored, but the rivalry was there and honors fluctuated between them. Now Gilbert was head of the spelling class, now Anne, with a toss of her long red braids, spelled him down. One morning Gilbert had all his sums done correctly and had his name written on the blackboard on the roll of honor, the next morning Anne, having wrestled wildly with decimals the entire evening before, would be first. One awful day they were ties and the names were written up together. It was almost as bad as a take notice and Anne's mortification was as evident as Gilbert's satisfaction. When the written examinations at the end of each month were held the suspense was terrible. The first month Gilbert came out three marks ahead. The second and beat him by five. But her triumph was marred by the fact that Gilbert congratulated her heartily before the whole school. It would have been ever so much sweeter to her if he had felt the sting of his defeat. Mr. Phillips might not be a very good teacher but a pupil so inflexibly determined on learning as Anne was could hardly escape making progress under any kind of teacher. By the end of the term Anne and Gilbert were both promoted into the fifth class and allowed to begin studying the elements of the branches by which Latin, geometry, French, and algebra were meant. In geometry Anne met her Waterloo. It's perfectly awful stuff, Marilla, she groaned. I'm sure I'll never be able to make head or tail of it. There is no scope for imagination in it at all. Mr. Phillips says I'm the worst dunce he ever saw at it. And Gil, I mean some of the others are so smart at it. It is extremely mortifying, Marilla. Even Diana gets along better than I do. But I don't mind being beaten by Diana. Even although we meet as strangers now I still love her with an inextinguishable love. It makes me very sad at times to think about her. But really, Marilla, one can't stay sad very long in such an interesting world, can one? (laughs) 